Uncle Justin Neb, Life, Health, and Vitality. This is Minkau Shakin Ra Allah. And today we are going to be continuing with our daily podcast about the afterlife cloning experiment. So if you missed yesterday's podcast, you definitely want to go back and listen to it. But I will summarize some of the stuff that we talked about yesterday. So we're going to be focused on mummification and the purpose behind mummification as it relates to mortuary literature and specifically the sesh um, duad. So we are strictly focused on the first hour of the 12 hours that compose the text. So we're going to listen to a little bit of that. We're going to look at some of the funerary practices during the first intermediate period. And then we're going to decode the secret of mummification. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get back into chapter one, and then I will come back with the rest of my commentary. The serpents sing and exalt you, and the divine serpents light in thy darkness for you. O Ra, the goddess of the hour comes to you. The two soul goddesses tow you along in your form, and you take up your position on the ground of the field of this land. You have taken possession of the night, and you will bring in the day, and you do likewise make long the hours, and your boat comes to rest. You seize the grain of the god Henbet in your secret place of Ned. You open Ned Ra, you uncover the god Sheba, the Uraeus goddesses, the Netcherit of Ernest, acclaim you, the Uraeus goddesses ascribe praise to you. Your word is ma'at against your enemy. Mm. You give tribulations to those who are condemned. The majesty of this God uttereth words after he came forth into this court. He does battle at the fortifications thereof. The doors of this court are strong, saying, Shut your doors by your bolts. Come ye to me. Advance ye to me. Make ye your way to me and ye shall abide in your place. Take your stand on the banks of the stream of Ernest. This great God passes by, and they wear well when he has gone by them in the field of Ernest, the goddess of the hour, who guides this great God as they well through this court is Ushem Hat Kefetiu Nu Ra. Those who are in this picture praise this great God after he has come forth to them. And behold, it is their words which lead him to them. They lament when he passes onwards, having spoken words to them. Behold, these gods are they who make the words of those who are upon earth to reach the God. And it is they who make souls to approach their forms. Their work consists in causing the coming of being the offerings of the night and in performing the overthrow of enemies at their hour. It is they who guard the day and who bring on the night until this great God comes forth out of the thick darkness to repose in this court of the eastern horizon of heaven. They cry out in lamentation to this great God, and they utter wailings for him after he has passed by them. Those who know them shall come forth by day and he shall be able to journey during the night to the divisions of the great double city. The lower register says, those who are in this picture give unto this great God the seasons and the years which are in their hands. When this great God has made speech with them and they have life through the voice of this great God and their throats draw in breath. For when he cries to them, he orders them to do what they are to do and he appoints to them green herbs in abundance in their field, and they supply with the green herbs of Ernest the gods who are in the following of Ra. And they make offerings of water to the spirits by the command of this great god, and they kindle flames of fire in order to burn up the enemies of Ra, and there is wailing to them, and they lament after this great god has passed them by. Am Nebwi is the guardian of this field. Whosoever knows this 
is in the condition of a spirit equipped with words of power in the gods protector. The gods of the Duat spoke to this great god as he entered in with understanding to the boundary, and he is born over Netra into earnest, saying, Hail those who rises as a mighty soul, who has received the things which belong to the Duat. The guardian of heaven lives in Tatarseret. Come thou and cast thou thine eye in thy name of the living one Kepara at the head of the Duat. Traverse thou this field, O thou who has might. Bound thou with fetters the Ha'u serpent and smite thou the serpent Neherhera. There is rejoicing in heaven, and there are shouts of gladness upon the earth at the entrance of thy body. He who shines sends forth light, and the Uru gods give light at dawn. The darkness which is in Amenta, in thy name of Seker Shetau Ura, illumine thou the darkness. His jawbones are to him, and Ra taketh up his position in Ament. Thy boat is to you, and is thy right. You are guided along, and those who convey you over the water, and who dwell in the earth, make calamities to come upon Apep straightway on thy behalf. Your protector is the star god. You are praised and adored. Your soul passes on. You go onward, and your body is equipped with power, and the regions are open to you. Doors of the hidden land are open before you. Osiris comes to you. Osiris avenges you, and your word is ma'at against your enemies. You go to rest. You go to rest in Amenta, and you come into being in the form of Kepara in the east. This great God sends forth word to the gods who dwell in the Duat and those who inhabit Ernest, saying, Open ye your hidden doors, so that the God may look upon you and may throw aside your darkness, that you may draw your water from Ernest and your bread, and that wind may come to your nostrils, and that you may not be destroyed and overcome by your own foul odor, and that you may not be choked by your own dung, and that you may untie and cast away your swathings, and that you may lift up your legs and walk upon them, and that you may stretch out your arms, and that your souls may not be made to remove themselves from you. O oh, you who live in your forms and who utter your words of magical power, who are provided with your swords, whereby you may hack in pieces the enemies of Osiris, whose seasons are permanent, whose years are well established, who pass your state of being in your hours, who dwell in your estates, who have barley in your bread cakes, who have loaves of bread made of the grain which is yours, whose word is ma'at, depart from my boats and retreat before my images, that I may vivify anew this your field. My soul is among you who have done battle on my behalf, who have protected me against Apep, who have life through my soul, who have being through my bodies, who establish your seats of holiness, which have been decreed to you that you may exist therein, who are with your souls by day, who are in my following in the Duat, when I make my way through the night and when I destroy the darkness. Oh, grant me your help that I may travel on in the following of my eye, and that I may journey forth with those who go to my place in the east. I avenge you, utter you cries of joy, for I order your destinies. When they have addressed this God while rowing along his boat, they cry out, and they bring him to rest in the field of the Nerpetir gods who are in the following of Osiris. If these scenes be done in writing, according to the similitudes which are in the hidden place of the palace, and if a man has knowledge of these words, 
they shall act as magical protectors of a man upon earth regularly, unfailingly, and eternally. The name of this hour is Seshet Maket Neb S. The third. All right, so we're going to stop there and let's talk about dark matter for a second because you heard a lot of references to freeing himself from the darkness. So this is an article on Science Direct. I'm going to drop the link to it in the chat. And uh, this is something that we discuss quite often on the podcast, but a lot of people don't really know what dark matter really is. So this article talks about the origins and the challenges of viral dark matter. So the accurate classification of viral dark matter, metagenomic sequences that originate from viruses but do not align to any reference virus sequences is one of the major obstacles in comprehensively defining the virome. So basically what they're saying is there are sequences that come from viruses, but we don't know where they come from. Basically, it's a mystery. How did we get these sequences of dark matter and where do they come from? Depending on the sample, the viral dark matter can make up from anywhere between 40 and 90% of sequences. We identify three factors that contribute to the existence of viral dark matter, the divergence and length of virus sequences, the limitations of alignment-based classification, and limited representation of viruses in reference sequence databases. So basically they're saying any nucleotide sequence that cannot be taxonomically assigned by alignment to any reference nucleotide or amino acid sequence, if they can't classify it, if they can't put it in a family, if they can't categorize the sequence, then they're calling it dark matter. All right. So now we're having a mirror of what's happening in the cosmos when they talk about dark matter and dark energy and how there's this dark matter, but we can't detect it. We can't take it and put it in a bowl and break it down because as soon as we try to, it disappears or it changes into something else and it totally breaks all laws of dome physics. And so as above, so below. Remember that the classical universe is a projection, a hologram. It is not real. The sun is actually black. The sun is a dark matter viral form. And so when you actually go into outer space, you don't see the sun because it's black. But we know that the sun exists because we can see it from our perspective on Earth. So now that we went over the viral dark matter and the correspondence between what is above and what is below, let's also mention a couple other things that I was researching yesterday. I learned about astroviruses. So astroviruses are a type of virus that was first discovered in 1975 using electron microscopes following an outbreak of diarrhea in humans. In addition to humans, Astroviruses have now been isolated from numerous mammalian animal species and from avian species such as ducks, chickens, and turkeys. Astroviruses are 20 to 35 nanometers in diameter icosahedral viruses that have a characteristic five or six pointed star like surface when viewed by electron microscopy. Microscopy, excuse me. It is a non-segmented, single-stranded, positive-sense RNA genome with a non-enveloped icosahedral capsid. Human astroviruses have been shown in numerous studies to be an important cause of gastroenteritis in young children worldwide. They can also cause infection of the gastrointestinal tract, but may also relate in encephalitis, hepatitis, and nephritis. So this is a close-up image of what an astrovirus looks like. And it's an icosahedral head, just like phage lambda. And it can either be essentially a five-pointed star, like the hieroglyph for the duat, or it can also be a six-pointed star. And we kind of talked about the five-pointed star and the six-pointed star 
So let's talk about that again, just to refresh your memory on that. So stars slash viruses as seals. We talked about the eight-pointed star of Rafan, the goddess Ishtar, Babylon, and the Roman god Saturn. We talked about the pentagram and the Pentecost, which in the Bible is for 50 days, remember? And uh, also the Star of David, right? Also appears to have the same morphology as an icosahedron that's spread out from three dimensions to one dimension. So with all of that being said, we are talking about viruses. We are talking about the quantum world, the actual world of DNA and particles. That is what's real. Everything else is an illusion. And so now this leads us back to this whole concept of mummification. So we're going to look at Egyptian funerary practices all throughout history, but specifically during the first intermediate period. So these are some different depictions of the operation of the funeral process and how elaborate a funeral was for ancient Africans and indigenous peoples everywhere. It wasn't like a funeral of today where we have, you know, maybe an organ song. We may have a pastor, you know, read a few scriptures from the good book and, and maybe a repast if that's a part of the funeral. And there also may be a procession at the graveyard, you know, for the family to uh, watch the body being turned into the ground at the graveyard. But for the most part, this whole ritual process, the elaborate ritual, the, even the mummification, the tombstones, and the spiritual work that was done at a person's death has been completely stripped from us because at a certain time, most people, you remember, were afraid of ancient Egypt. <laughs> they thought it was some evil place or you know, some mystical curse would come upon you if you learned anything about Egypt. I was one of those people because, you know, I was indoctrinated into the Bible. And so if you go off the Bible, the Bible will tell you that everybody else was wrong and only the Bible was right. So they had a very elaborate ritual process, mummification, which was a process that lasted anywhere from 40 to 70 days. And also the afterlife was a serious matter because everybody wanted to go to the field of reeds where it was peaceful for eternity. A funeral ceremony was thought of as a way to join the physical world to the eternal world and the afterlife. So now we're looking at uh, the house of reeds, which is the jhana of Islam, the paradise of revelation. That concept existed in ancient Egypt again, thousands of years before religion. So um, the Aru, the field of reeds, the Seket Hetepu, the field of peace, or the field of reeds, or the house of paradise from the papyrus of Ani is pictured here. And it was like an exalted version of mortal life on earth, right? So there was still agriculture, there were still animals, there was still work to do, there was food to eat, there was people to meet. It was essentially a continuation of life on earth. So there wasn't any, any stop to consciousness or any ceasing of the mind. It continued on after this person's death. Now we're basically referencing Ushaptis, right? And essentially every tomb that you go through, whether it's King Tut's tomb or Amenhotep the second tomb, Seti the first tomb, um, all over from all time periods, you will find Ushapti. So Ushapti are essentially little magical statues that were thought to come to life when the deceased had work to do in the afterlife. They would take their place and do the work required, leaving them to enjoy leisure time. After a person died, Egyptians believed that their spirits split into three parts, the Ba, represented by a human-headed Jabiru bird, the Ka, the spirit double, and the Ak, all right? Now, these things exist while you are alive. So if they exist while you are alive, they will also exist while you are dead, 
all right because they existed before you came into being they exist while you are in a state of a human and also will exist forever so these are the nine divisions of the spirit um and this is how they've classified them right we have the kat the ka the ba the shuyet which is a shadow an ak which is a transformed immortal self a sahu which is part of the ak the shekim or the shakim the part of the ak that has to do with spiritual power the ebb which is the heart essentially the mind the source of good and evil which has to be lighter than a feather and the name the ren so there were different types of burial methods right and different ways to preserve the dead not all ancient egyptians could afford the very expensive process of mummification in many instances it was only done for the nobility or the priesthood so for the poorest of people the body was buried in hot sand which would dry it out and mummify it in a natural way so even if a person could not afford to go through the entire mummification process the body can still be mummified if it's buried in hot sand all right because the sand is going to draw out all the moisture in the organs and all the water and the fluids that are in the organs and it will create a natural mummification so whether you were poor or whether you were rich mummification was still an option for those who were deceased so now that we talked about natural mummification i want to move on to some research that i did the other day about bacteriophage so let me pull up this article real quick what's going on mrs murph thank you for being here so here we go so this is a paper i'm going to also drop the link to the paper so you can read it for yourself but this is a paper about the natural mummification of the human gut and when we talk about natural mummification again we're talking about people that died and whose bodies were buried in in hot areas or like sand anywhere that there's hot humid climate and in this instance we're focusing on mummies that were in the americas so natural mummification of the human gut preserves bacteriophage dna again a bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria so the natural mummification process of the human gut represents a unique opportunity to study the resulting microbial community structure and composition we characterize the gut microbiome of three pre-columbian andean or andean mummies so this is pre-columbus right before columbus was here mummification was practiced all over the americas and we find mummies in peru that are perfectly preserved and i believe these mummies were discovered in southern america all right so there's three mummies f13 f19 and f112 and they found sequences from their gut microbiome that were homologous to viruses from the sequences attributed to viruses 50.4 percent one percent and 84.4 percent were homologous to bacterial phages predicted putative bacterial hosts corresponded mainly to proteobacteria and included staphylococcus clostridium Asseria, which is E. coli, Yersinia, and Bacillus. Predicted functional categories associated with bacteriophages showed a representation of structural replication, integration, and entry in lysis genes. I know this is very, very wordy, but just stick with me because it's going to make sense at the end. The present study suggests that the natural mummification of the human gut results in the preservation of bacteriophage dna representing an opportunity to elucidate the ancient phageome and to hypothesize possible mechanisms of preservation so what this is saying is that when a mummy was mummified naturally not with embalming or anything extra the sequences of all the different viruses and 
all the different bacteria in the gut were still there. They were still alive. All the genes were still there. Notice that it says the structural genes, the, the replication genes, the integration, the entry, and the lysis. So all of that is preserved thousands of years after death. Those viruses are still alive, and that DNA of that person that has transitioned is still being replicated. So just overviewing the connection between the mind and the human gut, the human gut microbiome is home to diverse communities composed of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Yet an increasing number of studies have demonstrated that the human gut is also inhabited by diverse viral communities, many of which are bacterial phages. So there's not just bacteria in your gut, there's also viruses. Now, we are just now discovering this in today's science, but the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Americans, the ancient African people already knew that there was still life in the gut and that there was still life in your organs, even though you were thought to be dead. Continuing, it says, Bacterial phages play important roles in biogeochemical cycles and in the evolution of their bacterial hosts. So this is the key that I'm that I'm getting at here. The entire cycle of the whole atmosphere of the ocean is regulated by bacteria and bacterial phages. And also the evolution of entire species, such as humans, is regulated by these bacterial hosts. And we are just beginning to understand the role of bacterial phages as part of the human microbiome. Yes, did they put the organs in the jars? Yes, sir. We're going to talk about the canopic jars right after this. It goes on to say gut microbiomes are also impacted by also impact human health odontis i'm not i'm not saying that right perio <laughs> periodontitis i think is what it's called periodontitis the relative abundance of bacteriophages belonging to the myoviridae family is higher in subjects with the disease compared to subjects with good periodontal health so they're basically saying if you have gum disease, right, or some sort of, you know, oral health disease, you tend to have more bacteriophages than people that don't. These bacteriophages are believed to shape oral bacterial communities by lysing their hosts and thus are believed to promote periodontal disease. Also, Inflammatory bowel disease has also been associated with bacteriophages with a dysbiosis of the gut bacterial communities probably resulting in the disease. So essentially, bacteriophages can be good or they can be bad because they destroy the good bacteria that you need, then you're not able to fight off diseases. But if they destroy the bad bacteria, then you are able to fight off diseases. Um, and let's see, is there anything else I want to get out of this? Okay. Metagenome, metagenome analyses show that the mummified guts included in the present study has sequence homology to viral genomes with a, pur a proportion corresponding to bacterial phages. All right. So this essentially just breaks down by percentage what kind of viruses were discovered in the gut. And so our data is consistent with authentic ancient DNA as shown. They have assessed patterns of DNA damage that could be consistent with ancient DNA, but did not note these patterns with the phageomes tested. So essentially the DNA was not damaged after thousands of years. And remember that the bacterial phage has your DNA in it. All right. Even though it has its own genes, your DNA it has to use your genome in order to replicate, 
and your bacteria in order to replicate. So that's a copy of your DNA that is perfectly preserved in the gut thousands of years later. Little is known about bacteriophage DNA preservation in ancient human specimens. Our study adds to the knowledge of ancient viruses by showing that the natural mummification process of the human gut results in the preservation of bacteriophage DNA. So this is just an overview and showing that they have perfectly preserved DNA in the gut because the gut is actually where most of your information is located. So the brain and gut connection is evident through multiple studies that have shown when we have an imbalance of gut bacteria, we tend to have more anxiety, we tend to be more depressed, and we tend to have more health problems. So what else, what else, what else? I believe that's it. I just wanted to give an overview just over that study. And now we're gonna explain the four jars of Heru. This is, this is where the organs are placed. And then we'll conclude. Thank you guys for tuning in. So um, in, the, in the comedic story, there's Heru has four sons. All right, and these four sons, I'm gonna show you what they look like. These are his four sons from left to right, Emseti, Duamutef, Hapi, and Kebesenuf. Now, beginning in the first intermediate period, Emseti, Hapi, Duamutef, and Kebesenuf were especially connected with the four canopic jars that housed the internal organs that were removed from the body of the deceased during the process of mummification. So these are the four jars that you were asking about. All right, and different organs go in each jar. And we'll break down which organs go in each jar but let's just look at the glyphs for a second and see if you can decipher anything here. Uh, for those of you who are new, you may not be familiar with these glyphs, but we did go over uh, this before. So here on, on this particular jar, we have a five-pointed star. Again, astroviruses or bacteriophage. And this symbol can be pronounced dua. Then we have a vulture next to it. So red from right to left, because that's the direction the glyphs are facing. Dua Mut, praise the goddess Mut, the vulture. And remember, in the coffin text, it says the deceased is equipped by the vulture. And, you know, vultures come along and they eat dead carcasses and um, dead animals and things like that. But from a quantum level, it is viewed as a motherly principle because she takes all the DNA and she takes it into her own body and transforms it into something else. So do I move to F we have a viper snake and we also have a determinative, which is a someone holding up what appears to be a crook or a flail. So do I move to F means praise, praise moot. And this one here to the right is Mseti. This is Kepsenuf. And this is the fourth son of Heru. All right, so we, we break down each one by glyph, but each one has its own organs in each jar. And so it dates back to the Old Kingdom, and it lasted until the late period or the Ptolemaic period. And after the Ptolemaic period, the organs were simply wrapped in place with the body. Um, going on to say, here we go. In the latter part of the New Kingdom, they took on their most distinctive iconography in which Mseti is portrayed as a human, Hapi as a baboon, Duarmuthef as a jackal, and Kebesenuef as a falcon. The four sons were also linked with the stars in the sky, with the regions of Egypt, and with the cardinal directions. 
going on to say that they were also considered to be protectors of the deceased. In the 10th section of the New Kingdom Book of Gates, a funerary text that depicts the underworld in detail, the four sons are portrayed holding chains that bind the maligned beings called the Wemtesh or the snakes. So here's another depiction. This one is from the 26th dynasty around 664 to 525 BC. So we see this tradition maintained all the way from the old kingdom all the way to the late period. Next, the four sons of Heru themselves were thought to be under the protection of four goddesses, usually Isis for Imseti, Neptis for Hapi, Neith for Duamut F, and Serket for Kebes Senuef. And these are just some more depictions. So this is a depiction of Kebes Senuef right here in the center, Hapi here on the right, and this is depicted in the tomb of Nefertari. And you can see here at the top of the tomb of Nefertari, there's an entire ceiling full of stars. So there's always this connection from this life to the next that is rooted in the stars. Because remember, the real world is a world of quantum mechanics and it's a, it's a quantum existence. And so the suns, or the stars that we see in the sky are DNA that is projected into the hologram that we see as stars. But in reality, it's DNA written in the sky. And therefore, the boat, the boat that they travel to in the sky is essentially a virus that takes them to be cloned and transformed into a crystallized species, like a star. And so when we look at sub-zero temperatures or absolute zero, we see crystallization happening at a more fine-tuned level. And you can see here, everything in the tomb points to life. Every one of the four sons of Heru is depicted with an unk on its knee next to it. Its name is written next to it. And we see unk everywhere, right? Right here, we see unk, jed, Waseb, life, health, vitality, and power. This says Nefertari Mut F. This says Un, a state of being before the creation. So leading back to other depictions of the four, the four jars. This is one of my favorite ones right here. Very colorful. Um, I believe these are made out of wood, though. But just the details in the painting, the color, the precision, the calligraphy is something that I really pay attention to because notice how I want to say homologous everything is. So every glyph looks the same from one jar to another. That takes precision, that takes focus, and that takes a lot of practice. So that is a depiction from 744 BC. And let's see. Okay, so this is some, some of the amulets of the four sons of Horus from the third intermediate period. All right. Again, very, very colorful, very, very animated. And uh, everything is always symmetrical when you look at Egyptian art. All right. And let's see. Now, these are the four sons of Horus depicted on a lotus flower before Osiris. So these are the four sons again, Imseti, Hapi, Duamut F, and Kebesenuef. Those are the four sons of Heru. And they are atop a lotus flower. So there's always this iconography of a lotus. So we can talk about what the lotus means briefly. You know that the lotus corresponds to a certain folding. And so when they are above this, this lotus, they are in a part of the universe where they have folded over into the early universe. And that's why they're back at the beginning of creation before the primordial God Osiris. And what else do we have here? We see 
hold on. Let's zoom in a little bit. Okay, I see see some Netru here at the top, and they're all holding a Wa scepter, which again points to replication and power. He who controls the word controls the future. And essentially, you have to control your own destiny by controlling the W-O-R-D of God. And so you see those Netru here also have the feather um, on top of their heads. And this definitely reminds one of Black Indian iconography and the Blackfoot Indians and different Black Indian tribes who use feathers um, as symbols of their culture and spiritual practice. So, yep, that's just an overview of that. This is dated from the Ptolemaic Temple at Deir el Medina, 3rd century BC. So, again, this tradition continued from the Old Kingdom all the way to the late Intermediate Period, all the way until the Ptolemaic Period, which corresponds to the time period where uh, a lot of foreigners came into Kemet. And they essentially appropriated a lot of the cultural practices, but didn't actually keep the tradition alive for very long. Because shortly after this, here comes Christianity. Here comes Islam. Here comes the Arab invasion of Kemet. And uh, the Persian conquest had already weakened a lot of the native practices that were already being repressed at that particular time. So we see here that um, even though Throughout the ages, they have tried to destroy these traditions. They have been well-preserved and well-documented. And uh, we just have to thank our ancestors for that. And that's just a brief overview of the four sons of Horus. So that's going to conclude this particular afterlife cloning experiment. Uh, one more thing I could point out before I go uh, just to refresh your memory, it's just the astro alphabet of the Hebrew language. Again, the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet correspond to 22 constellations, including all 12 signs of the zodiac, Canis Major, Southern Cross, Orion, Sirius, and the band of Pisces, along with the Southern Fish. So the connection is made clear between the quantum world and the world of the classical universe. So I'm going to let um, Judy K. King explain this one more time. Then we're going to wrap up this video. And then uh, we got some other stuff to talk about as well later on during the show. So let me let her explain this and then we'll wrap up the video. giving you a flavor for all this research which is enormous and it encompasses more than one discipline quantum cosmology biology physics space physics literature music it's in music i haven't even well we we touched woodstock here but it's in classical music gustav mahler uh everywhere the, um, you know, like the Garden of Eden and the serpent and all that. Um, but the serpent is like the shape of the DNA. Okay. And it, I know the serpent and that shape is on a lot of different things. Um, but I read something else too about the, something about what's on the dollar bill. It's a triangle. Triangle. You know, with the, the little eye. Yes, and I heard something about that too. And the eye is a big sign in ancient Egypt because uh, it's, so mm -hmm. it's well, they call the lambda genome has two arms, all right, and one arm is pretty much controlled by um, Goliath, and the other arm by David. So it has these two arms. They call them eyes. So eyes of generation, I would say. But yeah, um. Philosopher's Stone and the um, the diamond and the um, you know the pharaohs went um, you know wanted to transmute and become a star. Yes, that's all. Yes, the crystal virus. Yes, crystal skull. Yeah, it's all the that uh, the beige lamp, right? 
the stars, I think, and remember if we shrunk the universe down to the quantum, scientists today are saying that the stars are DNA written across the skies. So those magnetic fields in our universe, and remember lambda has the three transition metals that can create a magnetic field. Lambda, or let's see, viral and bacterial particles would represent the universe of stars, and that represents DNA written across the stars. Once it is on the quantum level, because the quantum world is the real. It's projecting this large classical universe. So when you pass, you go back to the real quantum world of DNA and molecules. And back to the idea of the serpents and everything. A protein has helices, and it looks like serpents. It might have three or four of these circular serpentine legs. And as it folds, it goes through these different stages, and it becomes works from helices until it becomes its functional state, where it's totally assembled at its native state. So serpents and snakes are a sign of protein, protein activity and binding and folding. All right. So, yep, you heard her break that down. Now, I want to give a special shout out to Brother Panic because um, Brother Panic was the one that actually referred thousands of people to this book. Um, I don't think a lot of people in the underground community knew about this book until Brother Panic broke it down. He did, I believe, four videos on the book. And the title of the video is called Detailed Instructions on How to Die and Not Come Back Here. And this was three years before he passed away. So I just want to say, you know, send my condolences to Brother Panic and uh, just thank him for all his work that he did. Because, you know, without Brother Panic, I wouldn't have learned a lot of information. Um, so shout out to Brother Panic. I hope he is a glorious, blessed Aku. And he is enjoying his afterlife it's a workplace it's a workplace why would it be dismal and if it is dismal then the work is probably some sad niggas telling you you ain't ready player <laughs> but i've been ranting about this whole however long we've been here Damn, that's good. All right. Sir Alan Gardmuir states that the word for netherworld was originally the place of the morning twilight known as the Duat. So the guy who sat next to me and said the underworld was a dismal place is recognized here as the morning twilight. The duat is a place for transformation. If it's dismal, well, I'll, I'll leave that alone. The individual ideograms in the hieroglyphs for duat means star. So a duat means star. How is it a dismal place, this underworld? It also means the house. In light of the fact that the deceased is no longer human matter, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, the Dewat must represent a quantum phenomenon mm. where those elements exist and are reassembled. There you go. The Dewat or the underworld as you go through to 12 stages in the underworld is nothing but code for the transformation process of you, Osiris, you, the dead Pharaoh, you, the dead king, you, the deceased sun god. And pretty much you is your DNA and your soul, your life, your will. Uh-huh. The... <laughs> It's a workplace. 
It's a workplace. Why would it be dismal? And if it is dismal, then the work is probably some sad niggas telling you, you ain't ready, player. Well, it's dismal for you. For those who have done the proper work in the pathways, it's a workplace. The Egyptian path to the stars begins with the deceased traveling to the northern pole region of the earth. You heard that. The Egyptian path to the stars begins with the deceased traveling to the northern polar region of the earth. So when you hear this flat earth concept of how you're supposed to go to the north and there's a hole in the ground and then you're going to go underground and you're going to be living it up with some underground niggas on some green sun shit. You stupid man. What the fuck? Do you think you're going to go down there and somehow become a better human? They got better broccoli down there? Now, doesn't this remind you of the story of Santa Claus, how they said, you know, Santa Claus and his elves lived at the North Pole? And that's where they did all their work. You know, that story always stuck out to me because I always wondered why Santa lived at the North Pole. So Christmas is celebrated in numerous ways all over the world. And nearly all of these ways involve the historic figure of St. Nicholas, who originally had nothing to do with Christmas. All right. So Center Claus is a celebration of the St. Nicholas feast day on December 6th while December 25th is supposed to be the observed day for Christ's birth, all right? So, however, in Britain and the United States, both Christmas and St. Nick have been stretched, refitted, patched together more than your oldest Christmas sweater. So, you know, they changed this story about the North Pole to say that there was this mystical white man with 12 elves who packs his pipe and move to the North Pole so that he could bring us gifts on Jesus' birthday. So this is how they twist mythology and science, and they keep it hidden for, you know, secret societies and the regular people just to get, you know, a nice story about a white man at the North Pole. So I'm going to end this by uh, just looking up a couple words. Shout out to keeping it plain. I didn't know you gave him an Uber ride to Walmart. Um, I do know that his funeral was in Atlanta, so I assume that's where he passed. So I'm just going through the dictionary and I'm just looking up the word star. And I see Aku Akinyu Seku, the spirit souls of the imperishable stars. Notice it says the souls of the imperishable stars. So that would mean that the star that I'm seeing isn't real. It's an illusion because the soul behind it on a quantum level can't be seen with human eyes. The Akumu Ortu, the stars that do not rest. The Akuhumu Seku, the stars that never perish. The seven stars of Orion. Hold on, let me go back. Ab Sechet was one of the seven stars of Orion and his god was Horus. Amut F. Abesh was a star god. Arit Aku, another star goddess. Arit Aru, another star goddess. Apet, the ox of heaven, is the name of another star. Flowers of the sky, ak hakek or ak hak, flowers of the sky or stars. We went over that one already. Akim Sek, a star near the pole. Isn't it interesting? Akim Sek is a star near the pole. Interesting, a polar star. Polaris, a never failing or imperishable star. A title of Ra, the never failing. The stars which never set below the horizon. So all throughout the, the hieroglyphic dictionary, if you just type in the word star, 
you'll see so many names of so many different stars. The seven stars of Orion, the stars that are at the poles, the stars that never set, the stars that never rest. Very, very much explained thoroughly. So let's play a little bit more of this and then we'll wrap up. It's about getting the fuck out of here and then mixing these quantum concepts yes. with earthly shit yet again. Ain't no freedom in the North or no hole in the goddamn North. The hole is in the magnetosphere and that's why you see the sun meeting green at this point. Why doesn't that phenomenon happen any place else on the earth but at the North? And when you die, I told you, the Northern Lights, are the successful green Osirian motherfuckers who did the work meeting Ra in the sun boat. You must meet Ra at the sun boat in the north. So you have to have the meditative genius to be able to still will yourself to this position. Freedom's in the north. Run to the north, nigga. So even that concept, a slave is in their DNA, is in the system as above, so below, to go to the north for freedom. Your freedom's in the north, nigga. Your freedom's in the north, nigga. So the first thing you do for the Egyptian pathway to the stars, begins with the deceased traveling to the northern polar region of the earth, guided by the unwary stars or pole stars. Right now, that's Polaris. It's the unwary, unmoving North Star. When you die, you follow that North Star to a certain position on the earth. That's the path to get to. And more shit happens, son. We're going to get into it now. Here, a great stairway exists where the sun god, Ra, or Ray, waits with his crew of eight to ferry the deceased through the double doors of the Duat. The double doors are the two lions. And you got to get through that. Mm -hmm. And it's a DNA thing. Right. And the double lion also is talking about the double membrane of the cell. So there's two membranes. You have a, a cell membrane and then surrounding your DNA, there's a nuclear membrane as well. So there's two doors that you have to get through. He also brought up the, the fact that the slaves looked to the North Star to get to freedom. So... I'm not sure if you guys have ever heard of this song. It's called Follow the Drinking Gourd. I remember this song from childhood. I think they teach this to children because I remember this from, I think, second or third grade, Black history. And uh, there was a song that the slaves used to sing. They had to create songs to kind of hide messages because they couldn't obviously communicate openly you know, with their slave master listening in on all of their conversations. So in order to plan for freedom, they created this song called Follow the Drinking Gourd. So let's play a little bit of that. Hopefully this is not copyrighted. Yeah, I don't think it is. Okay. <laughs> Follow the dream. 
seeking glory. Follow the drinking gourd. Follow the drinking gourd. For the old man's waiting for to carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking gourd. The river bank makes a mighty good road. The dead trees will show you the way. Left foot, peg foot, traveling on. Follow the drinking gourd. Follow the drinking gourd. Follow the drinking gourd. For the old man's waiting for to carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking gourd. The river ends between two hills. Follow the drinking gourd. There's another river on the other side. Follow the drinking gourd. Follow the drinking gourd. Follow the drinking gourd, for the old man's are waiting for to carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking gourd. Now, so that's, you know, a folk rendition of that song. I don't know how many of you are familiar with, like, the origins of uh, country music and folk music and soul music and stuff like that. But, you know, country music originated with black people. So a lot of times we hear folk music and we hear the banjo and we hear certain instruments and we think that that's white folks. And it's definitely not. Um, So that was a folk version of it. Let me see if they have like a um, different version of that. Let me see. All right. This is a song for black. Who's ready? Hold on. When the sun comes back and the first quail calls, follow the drinking gourd. Then the old man is waiting for to carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking gourd. Follow the drinking gourd. Follow the drinking gourd. For the old man is awaiting for to carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking gourd. Now the river bank will make a mighty good road. The dead trees will show you the way. And the left foot, back foot, traveling on. Just you follow the drinking gourd. Follow. Between two hills, follow the drinking. Now, this is the drinking cord. For those of you who may not be following, the drinking cord is the Big Dipper. All right. So the, the Big Dipper is right here. Right. And it's like diagonal to the North Star. So if you know where the Big Dipper is, then you automatically know where Polaris is. So. Let's go back a little bit to his video. We're going to let him break this down a little bit more. And then uh, we'll look at the Aurora lights. And then uh, that's it for today's video. So here at the north, a great stairway exists. I told you, at the northern lights, you see the green going up and the white coming down. That's the stairway to the sun.
Don't just take mushrooms, stupid. Take mushrooms. First learn something, take mushrooms, and then call yourself a fucking shaman. I'm a fucking shaman, nigga, from the ghetto. <laughs> and I believe in you is the same thing, but you cannot do it from a human lazy perspective. You can't do it. It's not how it's done. You must learn this kind of shit to a personal satisfaction and a personal knowing. You cannot stop. As far as I got, I cannot stop. I still won't stop after I found out now the true mystery and pathway to death and the true understanding or the, or the understanding of the concept, context of certain those symbols. The symbols tell a thousand words. These symbols could tell you other things and it told us many things. But we needed it to tell us the secret message or method to death, okay. which is very dangerous to give you because I'm telling you, the big shots are paying for this. The secret mystery to death is very valuable shit. Even when we did it, we didn't just give it out. I am only saying this because I know niggas can't do it. You can't do it. You'll get there and you'll fail. And they'll, you'll see why. They'll tell you, fail your shit. Here, a great stairway exists where the sun god Ra waits with his crew of eight to ferry the deceased through the double doors of the Duat. The deceased is urged to go up upon the great west side of the sky and go down upon the great east side of the earth. So it's telling you a specific pathway to go. The deceased is urged to go up the great west side, and you should know this based upon the north star. Mm -hmm of the sky and go down the east side of the earth with the gods in the suite of Osiris, in the, I'm sorry, in the suit of Osiris and the sun god Ra, CT18, which is, uh, what do you call it? Coffin text 18, Orion or Orion, which is PT 437, 446, 472, 738 and Sirius. PT 473. So sun god, uh, so the sweet of Osiris and the sun god Ara, or Orion and Ra or uh, Osiris and Sirius or, right. So the, the suit of Osiris and the sun god Ra are the imperishable stars and are the general direction of the deceased travels from west to east. The deceased travels from west to east. So once you're at the North Star, the next pathway is from west to east. West to east, I guess. West to east. Because you're going to go... And this is in Coffin Text 18118. Against the background of the Milky Way, or what they call the Street of Stars. That's, this is Egyptian writing, PT. You time I say PT, CT, and the number, that's coming from the text. So, against the background of the Milky Way or the Street of Stars, PT 262. These directions prompt one to ask three questions. Where is the Duat? Why go to the Northern Polar Region? And what is the Great Stairway? So I just read to you the direction of the pathway laid out by the Egyptians and decoded, but we still don't know. So that's why we ask these three questions and she breaks it down a little bit more. Where is the Dua? According to the text, after going northward to the pole, the deceased merges with the sun god and travels into the dark Dua in a west to east direction. From our perspective in outer space, we would observe the Earth rotating counterclockwise. Okay. 
Our new science of space physics is only 35 years old, yet Egyptian textual references to crossing the waterway of the sky window, the lake, the sea, navigating the winding waterways and being towed over the district waters with ropes of iron, CT-62, point to the actual dynamics and energy structures 21st century researchers are currently investigating in our magnetosphere, in our magnetosphere, in our magnetosphere. So she's pretty much saying Egyptians had all of this. You have all of this. So anything she's uncovering is not a discovery. It's a re is is understanding what we already discovered. This is ours. Exactly. That's why Sankofa means to go back and get what you lost, right? Because they have taken over all of our secret books and all of our legacy has been taken over and co-opted so as an aside i do want to talk about frank wilshek for a second because frank shilsek uh won a nobel prize for creating a mathematical solution for a time crystal and basically what he proves is that time symmetry can be violated um at certain states when it's cold enough so when it's cold enough you can technically travel or break whatever time you're in at that particular moment and he basically breaks it down and has proven mathematically that there are different states of matter that break time symmetry so uh the first symmetry of time i want to talk about is time reversal symmetry also called t uh, this is a classic subject uh, that, uh, in my uh, uh, self-serving point of view, is the whole point of it is to lead to axions. <laughs> <laughs> so few aspects of experience are as striking as the asymmetry between the past and the future. If you run a movie of everyday life backwards, it does not look like everyday life. The second law of thermodynamics famously captures this uh, idea that entropy increases, doesn't decrease. And here's an experiment showing that if you run a movie backwards, it doesn't look like everyday life. <laughs> of course, this one doesn't exactly look like everyday life even if you run it forwards. But, but, but even less does it look like everyday life if you run it backwards. Yet. It obeys the laws of physics to a very, very high accuracy. Uh, if you look back at the atoms, they're all moving in accordance with the microphysical laws. You, you find a very peculiar initial state with the ground shaking and dust on the ground for no particular reason. And then it all comes together and makes sense. And <laughs> the energy uh, that it takes to lift all this stuff you learn came from liberation of uh, chemical energy and a building. So uh, macroscopic time reversal is not, in, in everyday life, time reversal symmetry is just not a feature of experience. Yet, somewhat paradoxically, and even problematically, uh, time reversal symmetry was a notable property of the fundamental laws of physics for several centuries, starting with Newtonian mechanics, where you, you meet second derivatives of, with respect to time, so you can change the sign. Uh, and continuing through general relativity and quantum electrodynamics. They all have time reversal <gasps> symmetry. Why? Why do you have this gratuitous symmetry that is not necessary to describe experience and yet has featured in the laws of physics? As long as T symmetry appeared to be an exact fundamental feature of physical laws, it was unclear that asking that question would be fruitful. You can always keep asking why. Any of you who've dealt with a small child know that uh, they'll keep asking why. Why is the sky blue? 
and you start to talk about scattering of light and atoms, and, and then they ask why. Oh, Maxwell's equations, quantum mechanics. <laughs> and, then, and then they ask why. <laughs> and uh, well, you say string theory. Yeah. <laughs> and then they ask why, and they say, and at some point you just have to say that's just the way it is. Right. That's rock bottom. <clears throat> and if T symmetry were an exact feature of the fundamental laws, that would have been a sensible answer. That's just the way it is. Okay, it's a very elegant principle, sort of thing you might like to have in the fundamental laws of nature. It just might have been rock bottom. <clears throat> However, that answer became inadequate in 1964 when James Cronin and Val Fitch discovered a subtle effect in the, dec in the uh, decay of K-mesons that slightly violates T-symmetry. Now, actually, for purists, they found uh, an effect that violates CP symmetry, combining uh, charge conjugation and parity. But there are very uh, profound reasons to believe that CPT symmetry is an exact law of nature. So this could also be interpreted as violation of T symmetry. And in the intervening years, there have been experiments that directly show violation of T symmetry. So T symmetry is not rock bottom. And it's not even quite true, just very nearly so in practical circumstances. Why? Stuck looking through dozens of lessons to find. Well, this was a profound question and the uh, satisfying answer is that we've almost nailed it. I should say the almost satisfying answer is that we've almost nailed it. Uh, the basic sacred principles of modern physics, relativity plus quantum mechanics and, uh, sorry Lenny, uh, local symmetry <laughs> are very powerful. And when you combine all of them, you find very powerful constraints, very strong constraints on the laws of nature. And what uh, Kobayashi and Maskawa taught us in the context of the standard model, which is our instantiation of these principles, is that uh, when you have uh, the particles we actually have with the, 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 the color and flavor and weak and electromagnetic charges they have, uh, there are exactly two possible sources of T violation. There are exactly two interactions which could give you uh, T symmetry violation. One of them, which is the one that uh, Kobayashi and Maskawa actually identified, arises when you have three families of quarks, and it beautifully explains what Cronin and Fitch observed, and by now a lot more, starting with the prediction that there are three families, but going on now that the the uh, study of heavy mesons and, and quarks has advanced to, to describe quantitatively uh, a raft of experimental results. It's been extraordinarily fruitful, and Kobayashi and Moskawa uh, deservedly won a Nobel Prize for their very profound but simple uh, suggestion. But they didn't realize that there was another possible T-violating interaction. This is much more subtle. It's not visible in perturbation theory. Uh, and it doesn't happen to very good approximation. It would represent a interaction between gluons in, the, in, uh, in QCD, which is like an E dot B interaction. It's the analog of E dot B. Uh, you don't see E dot B very much in discussions of Maxwell's equations because it doesn't contribute to the classical equations of motion. And so you don't have to worry about it uh, for most purposes. Uh, but in QCD, it's very different. When you quantize the theory, you find that this E dot B interaction does play a role and it is directly violating parity and time reversal symmetry because E is natural and B is unnatural under time reversal. So why 
is still open, we have a question. Why is that interaction so small? It's allowed by the sacred principles. We've explained everything else in terms of them. Why not? Why is that still a loophole? Over the past 40 plus years since this became evident, there have been several attempts to explain it, but only one has stood the test of time. Little joke there. <laughs> and the idea is, uh, can be explained non-mathematically, quite simply. It's basically due to uh, Roberto Pecci and Helen Quinn. Uh, the idea is to promote the unwanted term, which appears as a number in the standard model as it comes, into a dynamical entity. So you have a coupling constant, G, which is supposed to be outside of time, a, a, a universal, eternal feature of the world, and say, no, that's a, an illusion. It's really G of X and T. It's something that can vary. It's a field like other entities within uh, the standard model, a new kind of field. And if it's a field and the dynamics is right, you could hope that the dynamics drives it to zero. And then you'd have uh, a theory of evolution that tells you why that uh, interaction is not present. Now, what uh, Steven Weinberg and I added to this is to realize that this fix comes with a price or comes with an experimental bonus, if you like, a, and a phenomenologically uh, testable consequence. This new field, like all quantum fields, is made out of a new kind of particle. It's a particle I named the axion in homage to a laundry detergent. <laughs> There's a little story there. I'll tell, I mean, when I was a teenager, I went shopping one time with my mother to uh, axial current, actually. Very, very weakly interacting, very light particles that uh, you can calculate recently been shown to give extraordinarily uh, accurate results for the structure of the universe. Mm. There were various advertised problems about uh, cusps and satellite galaxies. There are no problems. Mm -hmm. uh, so oh, here's uh, the kind of evidence for dark matter that uh, got the story, that story started. Uh, the rotation curves of visible objects at the outskirts of galaxies. If the uh, matter just tracked the visible light, would fall off uh, as you receded from where, where most, most of the visible matter is, but in fact it doesn't. And you can account for the observations if you have distributed around the galaxy a large halo of this non-interacting but still gravitating stuff. Wow. All right, I'm gonna stop it there. That was deep. I mean, I learned a lot from um from that in the dark matter halo of uh, the different states of matter and all those things so hope you guys enjoyed this video and i'll see you guys in my next one peace